Have women's roles changed over the years? Today we have two very successful business women joining us in the studio to talk about their past experiences and what they suggest for women entering into the field of business. Stay tuned for careers. Welcome back to Careers. My name is Peter Wolfel, and today we're going to be speaking about women in business. My first guest is Ginger Eisen. She is the president and founder of a Toronto-based company, Ginger's Bathrooms. Welcome to the show, Ginger. Thank you. My second guest is Etta Wharton, and she's the manager of Affirmative Action at Ontario Hydro. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, you both have various varying backgrounds. Um, Ginger, you come from an entrepreneurial background, whereas Etta, you're from a corporate perspective. Um, two different ways of, of living, actually, two different ways of approaching your career. One is maybe high risk and, and maybe high capital outlay, and the other one is also potentially, I guess, high risk, but uh, Maybe a little bit more of a stable environment. No capital outlay, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe we can start with you, Edda. Why did you choose to climb the corporate ladder as opposed to maybe going out on your own? Well, I don't. I must admit, when I first uh, went to school, I didn't think of those choices. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, went to university, I took a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, and uh, at that time, when you graduate from chemical engineering, you went to work for somebody. Mm -hmm. So I went to work for somebody. I went to work for the city of Toronto originally, and then after a year, I went to Ontario Hydro, where I have been for the last, uh, you know, 18 years. Um, it has, in general, been quite satisfying. Uh, if you want to ask me about the future, well, I don't know, you can always switch from one to the other. That's true. But uh, once I have got there, I found satisfying work. And so I sort of stayed. To a very large extent, that's what this show is all about, because people are sometimes switching in midlife and deciding on going on another career altogether. So this gives people a better understanding of, of what their options may be. Um, Edda, you're a very successful businesswoman. You've started your own company um, several years ago. Maybe you could tell us how you got it started. How did you even conceive of the idea of Ginger's Bathrooms? Uh, it happened by accident, actually. 1961. Empty nest syndrome. My children were grown up, about to leave the house, and I needed to do something to fulfill myself with. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a university graduate, so I had to do something that I was able to cope with, which was business. Mm -hmm. And I started very small in a very small shop on Cumberland Street. And I must say, I was very fortunate. I was successful from the word go with a company of one, me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. than a part-time staff. Chief and cook and bottle washer. Chief, I packed, <laughs> I shipped, I swept floors, I washed windows, I did everything. But it was a good experience. But I think the most important thing was the background I prepared for myself. I didn't know anything about law, I didn't know anything about real estate, I didn't know anything about accountancy, and I learned all those, a little bit of all of those things just starting to start up of the business, mm -hmm. which was a very exciting thing for me. I was like a three-dimensional person then. It was, I think, the most exciting year of my life. Mm -hmm. So you started in a little store which you rented, I suppose. No, and I bought it. Oh. I bought a little, little house on Cumberland Street through the hippie years. Oh. And enjoyed all the wonderful hippies. They were great. They really <laughs> were. And they even stole my bathtub, which was my logo. The kids in the university, and it was it was a very exciting period of growth. Watching the children, I was never intimidated by them. I felt sorry for them, but they were so bright. But my business just rolled along. Well, when you first started, you were selling already bathroom accessories from bathroom day one. Bathroom accessories. Were you importing in at I that time? I imported everything. Everything came up from the U.S. at that time, 
And so how did you get your first contact, let's say, overseas or overseas, in a foreign country? Overseas, the Italian country? Trade Commission sent some people over, tile people and sanitary wares. And the gentleman phoned me and said he'd like me to come and see the show. So I trotted myself down, and there was these beautiful Italian fixtures. They were just magnificent. He said, will you buy them? Because I don't want to ship them back. I'll give them to you for whatever it costs me to land. So I said, certainly would. And I phoned the city hall to see if I could get some approved for plumbing. And the plumbing inspector came up and looked at them. Toilets, I couldn't use, but the basins, yes. And he said to me, by the way, you should come to Italy. Because we have a very big trade show every March. I said, where? He said, Milano. And I said, when? He said, March the 1st. I said, OK, I'll be there. I cried myself across the Atlantic, <laughs> I want you to know. I had never traveled alone by myself. Mm -hmm. But there was this whole big, wonderful array of most marvelous product. The Italians are really tops in design. And that was how it all started. So at the trade show, you made some further contacts very there? Very good contacts. Established a, an exclusive license for some of the products? Yes. My, it was very difficult because in those years, women didn't travel by themselves, and certainly not women in the plumbing business. They thought I was a little weird until they got to understand that I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an easy thing. It took me a long time to gain their confidence. Excellent. Did you find that the Europeans were easy to deal with? Very, yeah, Good. very easy. Now back to the corporate perspective. Edda, your background is chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. Where did you graduate from? University of Toronto. Oh, great. And so you then started immediately with Ontario Hydro? No, I or? worked for the city of Toronto for a year before. I worked in the mm -hmm. water supply department. And then I went to research division, and I worked uh, at Hydro. And I worked there for five years um, as a research engineer. And I worked in uh, the petroleum area and a little bit in the water pollution area. Mm -hmm. And after five years, I went into the um, administration side of research. And I spent another five years doing that. And then I moved to the corporate office at Ontario Hydro, and I was an assistant to one of the executive vice presidents. And that gave me quite a lot of experience and of a broad overview of the organization. Um, it's, a, it's an odd kind of job, being an assistant to someone who has power and you don't have power. Anything you get done has to be in a very uh, uh, indirect kind of way. But it certainly gave me a lot of experience about the corporation. I learned about parts of it I never knew before, because research not only is physically removed from the head office, it's also a lot politically mm -hmm. removed. You know, people do, they are research scientists, they do their uh, technical work, and they don't pay a lot of uh, attention to some of the larger issues, the uh, role of the organization in, in the province, the strategy for the future, you know, uh, the planning kind of aspects. They're not that much a regard of uh, the regard of most research engineers. Um, and after uh, four years in the um, executive office, and my boss at that time was in charge of the human resource function. And I had spent a lot of time uh, looking at it for him and analyzing it. And I had been particularly, and out of self-interest, been paying attention to uh, the role and status of women at Hydro. And that had been something that they had first started to look at in 1975. Everybody looked at the status of women in 1975 because the UN said it was the International Year of the Woman. So everybody looked at it and patted themselves on the back and then did very little. And uh, Hydro started what they called an Equal Opportunity Program in 1980. And it wasn't a very active type of program, but they were sort of looking at the status of women and did studies. And in 1984, they... Uh, still found that there had been almost no change. There weren't very many women in the organization. There were mm -hmm. certainly no senior women. Uh, there were very few women in non-traditional jobs. They were mostly uh, all in the conventional uh, clerical secretarial jobs. And uh, I think they were getting quite concerned because there'd been no change over a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted to do something more active. And I made the then president a suggestion and proposal on what they could do. And, I don't know if you know this about Hydro, but if you tell them what to do, they say, go and do it. Not always. <laughs> but that's sort of what happened in that kind of situation. And I was looking for a change, so... Now, did this study just focus on the imbalance concerning women, or did it look at also at other minorities? Or at that time, it only looked at races. women. In fact, until this last year, we have only been um, paying specific attention to the status of women. But starting uh, late last year, and now I am part of my mandate also includes visible minority people, uh, Aboriginal people, and people with disabilities. And that's a whole new area uh, mm -hmm. and has its own 
its own set of concerns and problems. And uh, people who belong to those target groups also feel, uh, and quite rightly, that they have concerns in the workplace, that they're not getting a fair share. You are now the manager of affirmative action. Does that mean that you are taking some affirmative steps to trying to correct that balance? I think so. I, I like to think that we do. We have a quite a, a comprehensive program um, that, and, and quite comprehensive objectives. And I think to the extent that we have been successful, it's been because we have been um, very clear on what the objectives have been. And the objectives are an increase in the representation. It's very quantitative. It's great for an organization like Hydro because it's an engineering organization and people understand numbers. Right. But it's very quantitative. And uh, we want an, an increase in the uh, types of jobs in which women are underrepresented. Um, and uh, the other thing I think that has been, uh, has been a good uh, factor about the, about the program is that we have had a lot of commitment from the senior executives and uh, if you want things done the boss is the person that tells you to get it done and we've also um, had um, accountability for the program with the line managers now I can't I'm not going to suggest that that works equally well everywhere through the organization it's a big place mm -hmm. but if you're a manager at Hydro you have certain affirmative action targets and objectives that you have to meet it's part of your performance contract and there's nothing like uh, having to do it for your boss to getting it done. It's much better than all the persuasion and the nobility and the right causes in the world. There really are a lot of politics in, in a large corporation. Yes, a large, especially an organization as large as, as Hydro. It's like a town. It has, you know, in, in, in population, it's uh, got about 26,000 mm -hmm. regular employees. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's like a town. It has the whole spectrum of individual value sets. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, people there who are uh, very supportive of uh, women. There are people there who are very sexist. There are people who are very racist. There are people who are very tolerant. It has mm -hmm. the entire spectrum you would expect to see in our society. Mm -hmm. I guess that's a whole different set of problems than, than you have encountered. I'm in, just in thinking, small listening to Ed talk about it, how lucky my company is, my, my staff. My right hand, my vice president, is a lady. We've been together 22 years. She's also a shareholder in the company. Our staff is mostly women. Mm -hmm. The men are in the warehouse. Uh, financial director is a man. My wholesale manager is a man. One salesperson is a man. He's been with me 22 years. But basically, we are a woman company. And it's a very easy thing. I, I, I think I'm fortunate that I've never felt any attitudes about being a woman in the business. Either I was too naive to notice it, or it just never touched me at all. I just, I work in a man's work. I, I work in a man's field of endeavor. There aren't any women in the plumbing business. There are no women in my industry on the marketplace. Just to give our viewers a little bit more background as, as to where you're coming from, I, I have a report here. It's from Kitchen and Bath Design News, August 1980. Uh, 1986, where it describes you as one woman who wears a lot of hats. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it says, the founder and president of a Toronto-based company, Ginger's Bathrooms, Eisen is a retailer as well as a wholesale distributor of European, Canadian, and American bath and kitchen products. In addition, her company also imports a wide range of products for distribution in both Canada and in the U.S. and provides bath design services as well as contract services to builders. Now that's quite a variety of hats. I do. <laughs> wear a lot of hats. We do condominiums. We do building projects. We've done hotels, and basically our shop is open to the retail. And all that grew from a one-lady operation? Well, no. I have a good right hand there in Doris Palmer. She's <laughs> there with me all the way. We, we, we run it very well together. Okay. We're going to have to take a break now, but when we return, we'll speak again about women in business and how their roles have changed some of the problems that women are facing today in business. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Careers. We're speaking about women in business today. Uh, Edda, in, in order to, I guess, justify uh, an affirmative action program, clearly there must be uh, some imbalances that have to be corrected. Are women experiencing uh, significant barriers in, in today's business environment? And if so, what, what kind of barriers? 
Well, I think it's all relative because in some cases they're experiencing a lot fewer barriers uh, than they were a number of years ago, but there still are barriers. I think that the barriers arise because the role of women has really changed and the kind of jobs that they do and the extent to which they participate in the workplace has really changed. Most women in Canada work, almost half the workforce is women, uh, but women are very much clustered in a very few small uh, numbers of jobs and they tend to be the traditionally female types of jobs, nursing or the medical profession, teaching and the things that are associated with that mm -hmm. and the service sector. Uh, if you look at the whole range of job occupations patients that are recognized in Canada, women occupy a very small number of them and men are much more widely distributed. So um, as women have become more educated and that their education is a much broader spectrum and in the universities and almost all the professional faculties, a third to a half of all the students are women with the exception of engineering and even that is much higher than it used to be a few years ago. So women do have the training. In fact, I think, the, uh, I think it's true that the average employed woman has more years of education than the average employed man, but the kind of jobs that they have traditionally had have been traditional, clerical, uh, sales, um, and the health care. So as they move into the non-traditional jobs, one of the barriers is that a lot of people just don't think they ought to be there. It comes out of their traditional feelings about what kind of jobs women should be in. I think this is uh, particularly a barrier for women that want to go into the non-traditional uh, skilled uh, jobs, techni technicians, technologists, all the trades jobs. Um, that has been a male turf. A lot of men still resent women going into that. They can't uh, see them as doing the job. They resent them. There's a lot of sexual harassment in those kind of jobs, though that's not the only place where sexual harassment occurs. Um, and then they do one of two things. If a woman comes into that kind of job, and if she's passed all the barriers, if she's made it into the union, if she's gotten the, the trades training, or she's become accepted as a, an apprentice, um, either they don't accept her and teach her the ropes, and everybody learns a lot on the job from the, you know, the fellow colleagues, or they overprotect her and then don't get, give her the full experience. That's one of the barriers in those jobs. I think for, the, for women who have um, gone into secretarial and clerical jobs, and I'm talking mm -hmm. about in, in large corporations, um, many of them are very highly educated. There are many, many people, women in those fields with university degrees, but once they have been stereotyped as being a secretary, um, they have a lot of trouble uh, either contributing to the fullest uh, that they could, given their brains and capability, even in the secretarial role, or moving out of it. Uh, when you get to uh, women who are in professional capacities, it's not as difficult now for women to get a job uh, when they have a professional uh, degree. Mm -hmm. What becomes a barrier for them is moving up especially if they're in a corporation, um, and moving out of that specialty into general management. And um, I th a lot of women are experiencing frustration because after a number of years on the job, they find that there is a ceiling, a barrier that they can't seem to get beyond. And a lot of women are leaving uh, corporate life after 10, 15, 20 years in it and doing what Ginger had the smarts to do a long time ago, start their <laughs> own business. And Maybe that that's one of the solutions. That has become a very well documented phenomenon. The discrimination gets more subtle at the mm -hmm. higher levels. It is not an obvious discrimination. Uh, at the higher you go in an organization, the more how you fit in and your previous experiences and your previous relationships. Uh, you know, uh, ha that those things have a greater impact than uh, the qualifications, whether you are or are not an engineer, whether you are or are not, uh, you know, a scientist or, or whatever that credential. It changes. What's considered qualified at higher levels uh, is, mm -hmm. uh, is but different. There, but there are laws against discrimination. Oh, yes. Do they not take care of that? It's very difficult to prove that you have been actively discriminated against, especially at, at higher levels. It's very subtle. Uh, no smart organization in this country has any policies mm -hmm. or practices that are written down that are in any way discriminatory. But if you recall just a little while ago, uh, there was a man at the LCBO laboratory, and he was um, a South Asian. And he took a case to the Human Rights Commission about discrimination. It took him years to get that case heard and, uh, you know, a solution. And that was the first case that was at where the job was ever taken away from the incumbent and given to the other person. So it's a hard struggle, and it's very difficult to prove. As I said, it's, it, the, uh, the criteria are very much subjective. Uh, it is hard to prove, for example, that, uh, you know, you don't fit in, that that, mm -hmm. some, that, that was used as a, a way of keeping you out. 
don't think people in, in necessarily do it with intent. Right. They, but it, it happens often inadvertently. Uh, mm -hmm. Women in corporations are trying to move up in a system that was created basically by white, able-bodied men. And it has many factors that uh, favor white, able-bodied men. And people who are in a minority, whether it's women or other minority group, uh, have more trouble in that system. That's what a systemic barrier is. It's a barrier right in the system. And the people creating that system didn't do it to keep people out. Is there anything that women can do other than starting their own business to try and cope with some of these problems, to help themselves? Yeah. I think there is. I think that uh, one thing they should, that I suggest that they do is that they become very aware of their organization, and that includes uh, the official system and the unofficial system. How do things happen? Uh, the politics, if you want to call it, of an organization. I think you have to be astute to that. I think you have to stand up for yourself. I think you have to uh, be aware of what's happening to your male colleagues. Let's say you're a young professional that comes into an organization. You should be watching what happens to your male colleagues. Are you getting the same kind of things, rewards, training that mm -hmm. they're getting? Uh, you know, if you're doing the same kind of work, are you moving mm -hmm. through the organization or up the organization at the same rate? The other thing is I think women should support affirmative action programs. And I think they should support other women. I think that's extremely important. I think often they, they feel that they, they don't need to. They can make it on their own. Nobody okay. makes it on their own. Thank you, Edda. Um, Ginger, back to your business, entrepreneurship, for a second. You say in, in your resume that you've actually started and created a whole new industry. That I did. There what does your industry encompass? What business areas? When you talk about an industry, obviously there must I'm be a lot of pr businesses and also competition coming in. Oh, there's a lot of competition. The industry I speak about is the decorative bathroom business. There wasn't such a thing available mm -hmm. when I started in business. It was your ordinary little white thing and the toilet was a toilet was a toilet. <laughs> when I started bringing merchandise in from Europe, it was style. The designs were wonderful. That was one aspect of it. And we preached larger bathrooms because they were little five by seven things. And as the 60s rolled along, women were coming into the workforce. I was an early starter. And as a mother and a working wife, you don't have much free time. That free time was very important. And the only place you have it really is in your bathroom. Mm -hmm. So I advocated larger bathrooms, and I talked about it and talked about it to the plumbers, to the contractors, to builders, architects. So we, re we created an industry with product, number one. We created another industry with builders, architects, to give space to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. We brought innovative product into North America. All the big major companies have followed us. They are now doing their own. Everybody wants to get in. Everybody's on a good thing. into it. Yeah. All the all our big competitors <laughs> are now doing what Europe is doing, because they've had to sit up and take notice. Because this is a business now. Mm -hmm. So well, now that's that they what done. they have sat up and taken notice, and you are uh, a leader in your field. I love the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> what steps uh, is your company taking for the future? Well, technology will. Notice will, you brought a little yes, gadget I brought, here. I brought a little. Uh, control here. This is for a Whirlpool tub. It's a pneumatic control that is installed on your tub that gives you the degree of the temperature of your water and there's also a safety feature there that will not, your, your jets won't come on until you have enough sufficient water in your in your bathtub mm -hmm. and it's not electrical, it's pneumatic. So these are the things that are happening in the business. A technology is taking over. Um, I was reading in the paper, Japan is producing a toilet now that's going to do many functions. It's going to be a B-Day complete, and as a matter of fact, I don't know how many people saw it. There's <laughs> one that's going to test your blood pressure and many, many other things. Okay. This is what's happening. Excellent. We only have a couple of minutes left. In that time, I'd like to ask both of you, is, is the concept, the idea of a superwoman still valid today? Can a woman do both, have a career, and also look after the children? I say so. I've done it. <laughs> I 
say so too, but I think that the mythology of the, the superwoman is, is really one that's very de uh, detrimental to women mm -hmm. because it suggests that you have to be uh, top, better than everybody else, very competitive, um, and be able to do everything always at the same rate. And I think that puts demands on women that no human being can meet. I think that the, if you look at the question, can a woman have a family and a job? Nobody asks that question about men. Mm -hmm. uh, every man is expected to have both a family and a job. It's seen as an asset. Mm -hmm. I don't know why you know, we ask it about women. I think women have to stop playing that treadmill. I think they have to uh, uh, acknowledge that they have and want families, that those things take time, and that they, d they want and deserve and can earn uh, jobs as well. Mm -hmm. uh, are you both uh, mothers also? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. So I'm a grandmother. I have five grandchildren. <laughs> I have two children. <laughs> well, I don't have any yet, but <laughs> anyway. I so think you need supportive families behind you. I you really do. do. Are, are men do that? Are men finding these problems? I mean, we have we have been talking about women, but just briefly, are men finding these problems also? Are, are they becoming house husbands? Uh, I think that's very rare. I don't think men get a lot of support for mm -hmm. that kind of role. I think a few have done it. They've been kind of pioneers. But I think mm -hmm. that uh, certainly if, if women are not going to be stressed out by having two jobs, they are going to... They, will expect and I think have a right to uh, support in the in the home. Maybe as women's equality starts to take effect and they start to have a lot more women that are earning the same wage or even more than men, maybe then the man will stay home and look after the children. Maybe there will be the incentive to have whoever the breadwinner, the major breadwinner, will continue, that at continue all. working. No? I think it should be equal. I don't agree with that kind of equality. Mm -hmm. I think that everybody should work and, and do what they do best and be equal. I've never felt any feminism at all. I've never liked that, that terminology. Mm -hmm. I do what I do very well. I know it well and I'm accepted. My family is supportive. I don't want any special treatment. My family don't want any special treatment. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm disagreeing with everything you're saying that's there. Right. <laughs> but that's the way it is for me. Okay. I think you've been a feminist all your life and you're just uh, a little bit scary of the title. Uh, no, I hate the word. <laughs> I like being a lady. I like a it man to open up a door for but me. But those things, that's a mythology that those things are not... Uh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we're out of time now. <laughs> <laughs> Just when it gets good, right? I know, it's getting very interesting. But in any case, thank you, Etta and Ginger, for joining us today on Careers. Thank you for having us. My name's Peter Wolfel. From all of us here at the studio, good luck in your career. <laughs>